and welcome to Faith Invest in Conversation. I'm Nana Francois, Director of Membership here at Faith Invest, and I'd like to introduce my colleague, Mike Evan. Thank you, Nana. I'm Mike Evan. I'm the Director of Research and Strategy for Faith Invest. Today, we are in conversation with Dave Zellner, Chief Investment Officer at Westpath Institutional Investments, managing around 21 billion of assets on behalf of the United Methodist Church and 100,000 participants. Dave, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be with you. So Dave, it would be great to start off just understanding a bit about your role and your time in Westpath. I think you've been there since 1997 and you're involved not only in investment management, but also in investment services and in sustainable investment. Maybe tell us a bit about your journey in Westpath and what Westpath is focused on. Well, like you said, Nan, I joined Westpath in 1997. And as you mentioned, we're about $24 billion. We manage money for pension plans, other benefit plans, health plans, death and disability plans. And we also have what we call an outsized, outsourced chief investment officer platform on behalf of about 125 United Methodist institutions, organizations affiliated with the United Methodist Church. And that could be endowments, foundations, children's homes, adult senior living centers. We actually have children's homes in a cemetery. So we like to say that we manage money from cradle to grave on behalf of the United Methodist institutions. Are you exclusively for the United Methodist? How does your mandate stretch out? We're allowed to invest money on behalf of any organization that's in full communion with the United Methodist Church. So for example, in the United States, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America has full communion with the United Methodist Church, and we have the potential of managing money for that church as well. And there are several other churches for whom we are uh, permitted to, to manage money. Before we go into Westpath in a little bit more detail, it'd be great to get a bit of your background because you didn't start off in Westpath. You started off in a rather famous, large, well-known oil company. <laughs> Perhaps you'd like to share your journey from, <laughs> if you like, divest to invest, as some might put sure, it. Sure. I started right out of college um, with Shell Oil in Houston, Texas. And for my first 10 years, I spent in a variety of different assignments at Shell, uh, accounting, system support, and operation support. And it wasn't until after I'd been there for 10 years that I had the opportunity to go to work in the pension fund, managing investments on behalf of the pension fund. And I was there for seven years, so a total for 17 years at Shell Oil. And then I went to work for a very small investment management firm for about two and a half years. And my calling to Westpath was to atone for my sins for having had to work for an oil company and invest management firm. Oh, we think you're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> Can you give us an overview of of your staff, how it's how it's split up, how much how much resources you have at your disposal, and kind of how you think about them in terms of do you separate investment decisions from specific ESG and impact decisions? Are they all combined, etc.? We have four teams in the investment division. We have an investment management team which works directly with the investment managers and also on reporting and analytics. We have an impact investing team, which involves our positive social purpose lending program, as well as our impact investing that's in addition to our lending program. We have our sustainable investment services team. This is the group that performs the engagement activity. And then we have our institutional investment services team, which is responsible for client services and marketing our OCIO platform to the 125 United Methodist institutions. And it's a sales team looking to expand that, that group. Dave, how many people do you have? It's, you have a, a large fund with a lot of clients. 23, 23 people. It would be good to understand a bit about the values that underline the way Westpath works, both the Methodist values and then something about your sustainable model. Right. I think it's important to say that the United Methodist Church is governed by what it calls the Book of Discipline. And in the Book of Discipline, there's a whole section that regards the administration of the work of our agency. And it's very clear 
that we are directed by the Book of Discipline to manage assets solely in the interest of our participants and other stakeholders. We are directed to act as a prudent fiduciary. Now, when it comes to investing in alignment with Methodist value, there's a section in the Book of Discipline called the Social Principles. In it, it says we are asked to make a conscious effort to align our investments with the values of the church. So it's not a direction, it's not a directive, it's aspirational to align with the values of the church. Now we take that very seriously. And I have a dedicated team that looks at, um, to understand what the United Methodist values are and ensure that our investments will align with the values. And we also have a committee on our board of directors that's responsible for ensuring that we are making a bona fide conscious effort to align with the values of the church. So, so Dave, I know you've mentioned to us in the past that there's an overarching philosophy or structure that guides you. Can you Tell us about it again. For our investment program, we believe that we need to have what we call a sustainable economy framework. Mm -hmm. And our sustainable economy framework is built on the notion that in order to achieve the long-term returns that our participants and institutional stakeholders expect, that we have to have a sustainable economy defined as social cohesion, prosperity for all, and environmental health. Clearly, These are aspirational, but we think that if we are able to attain the tenets of a sustainable economy, that we would be able to achieve investment return expectations of our participants and other stakeholders. So take us one one step below the philosophy. So with that philosophy driving your investment process, how do you try to express that in your direct decision making? We have a set of investment beliefs. Um, We do think it's a best practice for our organization to define those investment beliefs and to get buy-in top to bottom of the organization, including our board of directors. And so it's the investment beliefs that really drive our investment decision process. And our number one belief is that we have to act in the best interest of our stakeholders. Anything that we do in terms of investing is going to be on behalf and the benefit of of our stakeholders. I think the relevant beliefs um, with regard to aligning with the values of the church is our sustainability belief and our low carbon belief. The low carbon belief says that we think, we're very confident that there's a transition to a low carbon economy that's underway and that there are risks and opportunities that are associated with that transition to a low carbon economy. And as prudent fiduciaries, we have an obligation to identify what those risks and opportunities are and align our investments accordingly. I don't know if you think in terms of asset class structure, when you think about your organization, about decision-making, if you do, could you tell us a little bit about how you actually execute these beliefs and these philosophies in each of the asset classes? We have commingled funds that we offer to all of our participants and our institutional stakeholders. We have a U.S. equity fund, an international equity fund, a fixed income fund, an inflation protection fund, and then we have a number of other specialized funds. So within each one of those funds, we apply our investment beliefs. And it's traditional investing, identifying sectors within each of those funds. So in U.S., we're looking at large cap, small cap, growth and value. In international, we look at emerging markets, developed markets, and fixed income. We're investing in government debt credit instruments that we have a we use primarily external investment managers for the bulk of our assets although about between four and five percent of our assets is managed internally through our positive social purpose lending program but i think if you look at our asset allocation approach it's pretty consistent with what you'd see with a traditional secular organization you mentioned your social lending portfolio, which is roughly 5%, and which is where I think you do 
a lot of your for-profit impact. It'd be great to give us a bit of the history of that portfolio, how it came about and how you're building up a team and how you focus on impact. Well over 30 years ago, the chair of our investment committee at the time was a gentleman named John English. When he joined our board, he was the chief investment officer at the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation had initiated a program investing in mortgage financing for low and moderate income housing. And he challenged the staff at the time, this was before I joined, he challenged the staff at the time to adopt a similar program at Westpath. We started out with a very small, modest investment of about $25 million to fund an organization that originated loans for low and moderate income housing. Well, there's something in the United States called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. And basically what that does is it provides for-profit organizations with tax credits for investing equity in affordable housing. Where we come in is by providing mortgage lending for these projects. The program is structured in such a way that the equity investors are incented to continue to invest in affordable housing in order to retain the right to have those tax credits. Mm -hmm. And so the safety, the inherent benefits to the mortgage lender results in very, very low default rates. Mm -hmm. And so we've now, we started out, as I mentioned, with a $25 million investment. Over the entire 30 years since we've investing, we've invested over $2 billion. During that period of time, we've had a little over a million dollars in losses, which is about five basis points. And I think most bankers would tell you that only five basis points of losses on a $2 billion lending book is a pretty darn good record. It's a very, very good record. The yield on that book, does it compare favorably with market yields or is it below market? We will not make below market loans. We price the loans. There's a recognition that when we hold the loans, we're going to hold them through the entire term. Most of our loans are at 18 years with a 30-year amortization. And we plan and we have held these loans for the entire eight, 18 years. Uh, so we do give up some liquidity, but we get compensated for that liquidity. So what we do is we rate we, we assess the credit of every loan that we make and we use third parties to assess that credit. And then we look at what comparable credit spreads are for similarly rated loans, similarly rated corporate paper. And then we also add on a provision for illiquidity. So we are intentionally attempting to derive what we think is a fair market rate in making these loans. Now, I will say that early in the program, we were able to comfortably deploy sufficient capital to build our book. But recently, there are lenders in the market that are willing to loan below markets, and they've they have various reasons for doing so. And in the U.S., we have something called the Community Reinvestment Act, which basically requires that banks lend in their local communities. And so they're willing to accept rates that are a bit below market in order to fulfill their Community Reinvestment Act responsibilities. We'll typically lose when we're bidding for these loans to um, organizations that are motivated by something other than just a fair return in, in funding these loans. Dave, did I ask you to go back to the more liquid asset classes? In, say, in equities, do you tend to hire managers who are ESG specialists, or do you tend to consider all managers and then work with a manager in order to create a program that's specifically suitable for you? We have a framework that we call avoid, engage, invest. And so let's talk about the avoid first. The United Methodist Values have asked us to avoid investing in companies that derive a significant amount of their revenue from alcohol, 
tobacco, adult entertainment, gambling, weapons, and private prisons. Now across the universe, those companies account for about 4%, 5%, depending upon um, the markets. Now, there are markets where we may invest in some of those companies. Noticeably, in India, it is most economical to invest in commingled funds. And so if you were to look at our Indian investments, which is through a commingled fund, we may have exposure to some of those companies. But with regard to our investment managers, all we ask that they do is honor our ethical, what we call ethical exclusions, the four or 5% of the investing universe made up of those type of companies. Do you provide them with a list or do you ask them to yeah, interpret we that? Them a list. We provide yeah. them a list. Yeah. The other thing that we want to do is we strongly encourage our external equity managers to be signatories of the UN principles for responsible investment. One of the principles is that you're going to consider environmental, social, and governance factors in the investment decision process. Now, of course, we will we have an annual questionnaire and we'll look for examples to ensure that the managers are aligning themselves with the principles. That's the vast majority of our money. That being said is we have employed several managers that are focused on ESG related issues. A notable, we've had a partnership with BlackRock where they have developed a proprietary methodology for managing a near passive, semi passive strategy that emphasizes companies that are preparing for this transition to a low carbon economy. And it de emphasizes companies that their methodology identifies as not preparing well for the low carbon economy. Uh, but the vast majority of our investment managers are not ESG specialists, but we have an expectation that they are considering ESG in their decision-making process. So I've talked about void. We've talked about invest in terms of our social purpose lending program. The other significant element of our program is engage. And this is where we have a team of folks that work with partners around the world for different organizations. So for example, the PRI is one, the Principles for Responsible Investment. We're members of the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, the Council of Institutional Investors, the Interface Center for Corporate Responsibility. So what we do is we have these partnerships um, with different organizations around the world where we identify issues that are preventing us from achieving the sustainable economy framework. And what we'll do is we will engage with public policymakers as well as companies to convince them to adopt policies and practices that are consistent with our aspiration for a sustainable economy. And uh, we, we spend considerable amount of time um, on this activity and we think that this is the way that we can build a sustainable economy is through working directly with companies, convince them to adapt policies and practices that are consistent with our sustainable economy framework. Can I presume that where you have a separate account structure, you do your own voting of proxies? Yes, the vast majority of our assets are in separate accounts and we have taken on the responsibility for voting the proxies. And so we have a proxy voting policy. We give that to a third party that administers the whole process for us and then pre-populates the ballot with what they think based on our policy our votes would be. We then review those and either affirm their pre-populated suggestion or we change the vote to what we think is an appropriate vote. I think a lot of our members are interested in ways to leverage their efforts across multiple clients, for lack of a better term. Westpath has done that quite explicitly. As a matter of fact, as I recall, Dave, you over the last few years have spun off basically as a, as a separate arm in order to be able to do that better. Could you just comment a little bit on your model working with multiple clients and maybe any advice you have for somebody else who's planning something like that or would like to use that? Well, first of all, there are a lot of other United Methodist institutions that want to invest in alignment with their values. 
and they've found that it's other than just screening their portfolios, other than just using the avoid element, there are very few investment organizations, hardly any in the United States that do what we do in terms of proactively investing in ways that make an impact in engaging with companies to persuade them to align their values with the values of, of the, the church. And in fact, what I say is that the avoid part is a part of what we do, but where we really make a difference is through the investment and the engagement element. The mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Transformation of the world means make the world a better place. You don't make the world a better place by avoiding things. You make the world a better place by investing in a manner that aligns with values in, in helping people and by convincing companies to change their business practices to be more compatible with what we need for a sustainable economy. That's how you make a world a better place. And so uh, many United Methodist institutions realize that traditional secular investors, that's not what they do. And so they've been looking for an organization that can invest in a manner that's more aligned with their values. And there are really very few choices. And like I said, we've been doing it since 1908. And so we've got a long record of not only investing in a way that aligns with values, but we've produced some pretty darn good returns over that period of time. So when they look at what we're trying to accomplish and the fact that we're delivering results, we've been pretty successful in convincing United Methodist organizations to use WestPath services for their investments. And, and David, if I understand it correctly, they invest directly into commingle structures that you have set up? Yes. As I mentioned earlier, we have our U.S. Equity Fund, International Equity Fund, Fixed Income Fund, and in Inflation Protection Fund. And if you want to combine them all together, we have something called the Multiple Asset Fund. And so all of the institutions will hold units in those funds like a traditional mutual fund. And if you could just comment on the regulatory environment in the U.S. specific to your functions, you, as I understand, you're not a registered investment advisor and you can commingle religious pension assets as well as foundation endowment assets. Is that correct? To the extent that we are operating only for nonprofit organizations, we are exempt and we are exempt from registration, uh, SEC registration. And on, on, the, on the participant side, we're not subject to the Department of Labor ERISA standards. Uh, as there is a specific provision in the Employee Retirement Income and Security Act called ERISA that exempts uh, church plans. And so we qualify under the church plan exemption. I know you have considered expanding your offerings to, at least broadly considered, to the faithful, literally to, 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 to the individual investors that might fall under the Methodists umbrella. And I know there are complexities with that. Can, can you just mention anything about your efforts in that space or your thoughts, I should say, in that space? Sure, Mike. Um, we frequently get inquiries from what we call members in the pews uh, to offer <laughs> our funds in the form of mutual funds to individual investors, members of the United Methodist Church. But that would require registration. And that's just not something we're, we're ready to do. In terms of the economic and environmental situation in which we find ourselves in now, what are the biggest challenges and opportunities ahead for Westpath? And how do you see the industry as a whole maybe shifting their focus or shifting their attention to address them? And maybe so, just in that regard, you mentioned the number of different organizations and partnerships you're, you're involved with. How do they all fit together to drive to a, a more sustainable economy? Right now, I guess... There are three issues that are a priority for us. And actually, two of them have just surfaced this year in 2020. Of course, dealing with the issues surrounding climate change and the environment in, in the low carbon transition is number one. We think it's critical that the world proceed on this path 
to align with the Paris Accords, which is to keep the increase in global temperatures uh, below 1.5 centigrade uh, above the um, pre-industrialized levels. And so that's the, the number one priority and we continue to work with a number of different partners, the Climate Action 100 Plus, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, to engage with companies as well as the asset management industry to do whatever is necessary to encourage companies to adopt policies that will reduce their carbon consumption and, and the emission of greenhouse gases. So that's number one. But with the onset of the pandemic, it's become very apparent that companies need to have robust policies in places for human capital management. And so there have been a number of different initiatives that we've undertaken during the year uh, to engage with companies to ensure that they have policies and practices that are supportive of their workforces so that they're able to transition through the pandemic and continue to operate sustainably once the pandemic is behind us. One of the things that we've really been focused on is to encourage companies to support their local communities because we think that small business is really the backbone of the U.S. economy. With work from home, a number of companies are continuing to operate but we think it's really important for not only the companies, but the employees of those companies to continue to support small business in their communities so that once the pandemic is behind us, we've got a basis for which we can regrow the economy. And then the third issue, which is uh, one that we're paying close attention to and involved in, is the result of some of the social unrest that we've seen in this country as a result of issues surrounding systemic racism. And, and we've long promoted diversity on corporate boards of directors, uh, but we're also asking companies about their policies to identify any inherent policies that continue to perpetuate racism and to, to begin addressing those issues. So the, I would say that those are the three main priorities that we're addressing in 2020. I, in my own mind, I have a vision of how you address the first and the third. Can you tell us a little bit more about the middle one, the second one? Without naming any companies, obviously, what kind of things have you engaged on in order to, to, to create the right kind of reaction or what do you think is, is, is the right directional move? Without mentioning companies, there's a company in the United States that has been very visible in terms of delivering products and services to people's homes. I'm glad and, we're keeping it anonymous. I, I'm sure no one has any idea who you're talking about. And, and, and this is a company that my, my understanding is in the second quarter, they've added like 175,000 employees. And they have multiple warehouses around the United States and the world where there have been problems related to conditions that perpetuated the spread of the virus. And so we just felt it was really important that this company demonstrate that they had safe working conditions that precluded their employees from um, catching the virus. And so we, along with other investors, engaged with this company to understand better what their policies and practices are around protecting their workforces. Dave, I must say at this point that as Faith Invest, we have the honor of having you as the chairman of our board. In closing, we'd like to ask, what is your vision for Faith Invest? So the United Methodist Church has been investing in alignment with its belief for well over 100 years. And we know that there are many other faith institutions around the world that aspire to align their investments with their beliefs. And so ultimately, I, I'm very supportive of the notion of Faith Invest providing the tools and the guidance and the advice to other faith-based organizations that will allow them to invest in alignment with their beliefs. So Dave, thank you so much for your time. 
today for telling us more about both yourself and West Perth and the way forward. Um, it's been really engaging and interesting to talk to you and we look forward to further conversations. Thanks. And great, great talking with you as well. Thank you. Dave, thank you again very, very much.